Um, so when I got an uh, invited email from you, um, then I realized that this is exactly 100 years of Weger's law. So, so what I wanted to do is that uh, in the initial days of my PhD, I started looking at some very fundamental context, uh, 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 concepts that we routinely use uh, in, in solid state physics. And then I wanted to look deeper using XFs, how those concepts look like. And from there, that uh, originates the title of my talk. And then I'll um, take you through the course of, of the talk and I'll conclude on, uh, with uh, what kind of strategies we can develop uh, to understand structure property correlations by looking at the length scales of materials um, at, at different length scales and connecting it to uh, electrical, um, sorry, electronic properties. So, so the title of my talk is A Local Structure Perspective on Weger's Law and Chemical Pressure in Solids. So as the title of my um, talk suggests, um, there, uh, if, if you look closely into the talk, we can separate it out into three separate fragments. The first one is a Weger's Law and Chemical Pressure. Uh, and I'll introduce you to some more fundamental solid state concepts like virtual crystal approximations, which are related to all of this. And then what I'll try to do is to give a uh, look at these structural concepts from local per perspective using XFs as a structural tool. And from there on, we'll go to develop a general strategy to link structure and property. So uh, I'll quickly go through from where is, uh, this all originated. Um, I, I started uh, working on uh, these kind of fundamental concepts in IISC Bangalore with Professor D.D. Sharma and in very close collaboration with Carl Segre Segre from IIT Chicago. And most of the uh, experiments that you would see um, were done at the Argon National Lab uh, with, with Carlo. And, uh, and of course, there are some, some other experiments that we have done in synchrotrons all across the world. And it's mainly Elytra, Soleil, and Desi. Uh, a significant portion of the theory uh, has been done uh, with Professor Ole Eriksson from Uppsala University when I was already a PhD. And some portion of the calculations has been done later on from Uppsala as well as IIC Bangalore. And right now um, I'm collaborating with a lot of other uh, uh, places as, as well. And Chalmers, uh, ESRF and HTZR are some of these. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through that at the end of my talk again. So to so start, uh, so, so this is, uh, uh, 100 years of the Weger's law. In, in 1921, uh, uh, L. Weger pointed out that, okay, if you look at alloys of two different materials, so, so he specifically take, has taken out uh, a potassium bromide and potassium chloride. And, and what he realized that when you look closer into the variation of the lattice parameters, they vary smoothly between the end members. So what essentially means is that if, if you make an alloy of the two materials, let's say A and B, and you try to make a homogeneous system uh, based on them, and you can see that the lattice parameters of uh, any alloy composition that you make can be smoothly interpolated between the two end members. So this is what uh, became the very famous Weger's law and, and a, a huge number of systems that we see today are uh, follow these laws. Like, of course, there are some exceptions to this law, but which I'll, look, I'll not talk about them today, but there's a huge uh, amount of materials which follow uh, this, this particular law and it's uh, tremendously used uh, even today. Now, based on this concept, people started understanding uh, how to model an alloy. So it started with uh, looking at uh, dopings at very, very dilute limit, which gave the concept of the rigid band model, where essentially you take a lattice, which is the red atoms here, it, it's taken as a solvent, and it has a periodic potential, but then you replace one of the atoms by another atom, which is the atom B here, sorry, the atom A here, and it's just a perturbation to the system. So, so what it essentially does is just shifts 
the Fermi level of the system. So that's why it's called the rigid band model. But not all uh, alloying uh, happens at a very dilute limit. Like right? so, so when you increase the concentrations, of course, this model immediately fails. And then people started uh, trying up uh, different kinds of uh, mo uh, models. And uh, the, the first one which came is that, OK, let us approximate the two different atoms uh, as uh, so you have a system where you have mixed two, two different atoms in very large scales. And then, of course, you can treat them as a sum of two individual pure systems, A and B, by approximating the wave functions for both of them as a coherent wave function. And this is how the virtual crystal approximation also, also came into being, that you assign a, a, an average potential of A and B and put that potential at one particular site. So then you, what you have is basically a composition average, uh, average potential at one particular given site and all virtual atoms are sitting at an ideal lattice site. So based on these, we have, uh, so, so the basic difference from, from the rigid band model to the virtual crystal is that now you have a smooth band gap variation. But what it essentially does is, Vigert's law talked about variation of lattice parameters. It didn't go down to atomic connectivities. What these essentially did is to reduce Vigert's law to connectivity between two atoms. So what you can see is that, okay, you, you, you have a lattice parameter of an alloy, which is A prime. So the distance between two atoms can now be used as a multiplicative factor of the lattice parameter. So if we look at a crystal, how does it look? Let's say we take a cubic system, AB and AC, and we make an alloy of the two, ABC. Now, when you look at the local tetrahedra, we will see that, okay, this distance and this distance are the initial distances of the two end members. Now we have a distance where uh, the, 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 the distance between these two atoms now scales exactly in the manner in which the lattice parameters scale. So what we got interested in is that we wanted to look at what the site identity of this virtual atom would be. Of, of course, there cannot be two different atoms um, which, 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 which look alike and, and occupy the exact same site. So we wanted to look at uh, very closely what happened to the individual sites. What is the concept of an average bond distance and how is the unit cell reconstructed when I look at it? individually at each site. Uh, so we now go to a particular system, which was hexagonal zinc cadmium sulfide system to see, okay, uh, how, how this material behaves um, when, when, when we uh, try to describe the system uh, in a global lens scale, which is from extra diffraction and local lens scale, which is excess. So, so this perfectly follows the Weger's law. We see that there is a nice linear variation of lattice parameters, and there is absolutely no ambiguity that hexagonal zinc cadmium sulfide, where cadmium has been doped at the zinc sites, this follows Weger's law, and there is a linear variation of lattice parameters. But uh, what happens Next is when we try to model uh, the XF. So this is just a simulation that 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 we have put in different kind, uh, di different number of cadmiums into the system and try to look at the experimental data, which has been done at the APS. We see that there is a gross mismatch and the discrepancy increases as we put in more cadmium in the system. So what is going on? So we probed the zinc and the cadmium uh, cages separately at the APS, and we immediately saw that there's a purely di bimodal bond distribution instead of an average bond length. So now this clearly says that the local structure is different from the global structure. And there is something funny going on because you have two different solutions, uh, structural solutions to one particular solid. So first of all, it could that be that, that, okay, zinc and cadmium are of very different ionic sizes and there's a huge lattice parameter variation. So it could be that the bond distance are not, not being able to catch up with the change of lattice parameter variation. So we move to a 
lattice parameter invariant system. And how do we do that is, is, is to follow that, okay, uh, we observed that, 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 that the manganese um, sulfide hexagonal uh, lattice parameters fall somewhere in between cadmium and zinc sulfide. And there is a sweet composition 51 and 49 where the virtual lattice will perfectly match the, mang the manganese lattice. And this is exactly what we did. We made a lattice parameter invariant system and, and, and you can see, I've, I've marked one particular uh, black ref reflection and we have changed the composition to a reasonable extent. And we saw that the lattice parameters are not changing. So now we compare this with our previous results. And this is exactly what we get. There is hardly any variation of the average metal to ligand distance, but there is a clear trimodal distribution now. Now, when we compare this with the previous result, we see that not only that, the zinc sulfide and cadmium sulfide distances in a lattice parameter variant system and a lattice parameter invariant system, they are almost similar. So lattice parameter change between the two end members hardly has any effect on the local metal to sulfur bond distances. So in either cases, the, the metal ligand distance is extremely well reproduced. So then we went and looked around in the literature and there, was, uh, there is a ton of work that has been done uh, showing that, okay, we can have individually uh, very different distance, but when we make an average of them, they nicely reproduce the virtual crystal line. So in both cases, we see that the virtual crystal line is perfectly reproduced by a composition weighted average because we are making an average of the two different atoms and, and assigning a virtual potential to the system. And what we saw is that this is a very general phenomena and a lot of work has been done with this. So we looked at, okay, we, we, we have a very specific uh, doped sublattice and then we have changed the ionic radii. Nothing has changed. The percentage deviation, which is the difference between the virtual crystal line and the experimental line slopes is very, very high. So, so, so zero would be your perfectly uh, the, the virtual crystal line. And there are, are a ton of other systems which show very similar behavior. It looks like it's very independent of the ionic radii or radii ratio. So, so the local connectivity between the two atoms is, uh, is, is not dependent on the ionic radii or the radii ratio. Uh, it's rather is defined probably by the elastic constants and not uh, the unit cell variation between the two end members. So, so this proved to be a, an extremely general phenomenon and, and all of these papers has been cited um, in my published work. So there is a very strange problem we are encountering now because what we have is that in an alloy system of zinc cadmium sulfide, in, instead of one atom position, there is a shell of sulfur, which is farther away when you, we are looking at a cadmium site, and there is a shell of sulfur when we are looking at a zinc site. So how is the unit cell being maintained? Because when you look at the diffraction lines, we see that the, the micro strain is very, very low, and the Bragg peaks are really narrow, and we have the sigma square values for uh, a very low angle and a high angle. You, you, you can always see that the the sigma square values are extremely low. But how can there be two structural solutions? This leads us to go to the higher shells because the, uh, the way we approach this problem was to, okay, so from short range, we'll try to make the snapshot a bit larger. And from the long range, we'll try to make it smaller to see what happens at the length scale of the unit cell. And this is exactly what we did uh, because it's, it's, it's very strange that one solid would have very two different structural descriptions at two length scales. So there, there has to be a length scale where they could roughly kind of tell the same story. And, and this is what we targeted for to find a unique solution to bridge the gap. So this is where I take the first break. So any questions? Okay, a few questions uh, while people yep. type them in also. Um, I'll start. Um, you mentioned the micro strain is very low. 
Um, yes. But all, all you've shown is a little is uh, some pretty routine powder diffraction. Um, yes. Uh, have you done um, a diffuse scattering study uh, or uh, tell me more about what bounds you could put on the micro strain? Uh, these are uh, there, there's not too too much bounds that I have put to be honest. These are like you said, these are polycrystalline data. But um, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, when we have very two different um, distances when we're looking at the local uh, bonds, there is, there is nothing uh, fancy going on as, as, as far as the periodicity is concerned. Because uh -huh. uh, uh, when you see the difference between the two, two bond lengths uh, for, from zinc sulfide and cadmium sulfide, um, if, if I go back to the, um, yes, you, 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 you can see the difference between the two bond distances is roughly around uh, 0.2 angstroms, right? And that is an enormous amount of change for a unit cell. Uh, at, at that kind of distances, you would expect the unit cell to collapse when the two atoms are coexisting in the same unit cell. So, so the motivation for this particular um, uh, uh, slide was to show that, okay, the diffraction peaks are still quite sharp and the crystal, uh, so, so, so the sample is perfectly crystalline. So there is something going on uh, at the very local length scale, which is not captured when you average, uh, when you're doing a volume averaging of the structure at a length scale of 50, 60 angstrom, which is typically what uh, uh, we, we do in X diffraction. Okay, so you're saying there's not a, a lot of strains evidenced for length scales larger than 50 or 60 angstroms. So it has to all be healed more quickly. Yes, yes. Okay. And this is all right. and and this is exactly what the second part of the talk will show. Okay, very good. Uh, I see there's a question from Matt Nouvel. Yes, this is Matt. Yeah, so, so can you say anything about the further bond lengths or is that is that what you're going to talk about next? <laughs> this is what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, okay, and, and I guess if I could have a, a separate follow up. You mentioned that there was a fair amount of literature. There, there was, there has been a fair amount of literature showing uh, similar effects that the local bonds. Absolutely. Stimulate. Yeah, but but you also show. I think I think you showed sort of nice, more more convincingly than earlier work, say of Boyce and Nicholson or or work from the '90s, that there actually is a small change in the, your bond lengths with with uh, doping or with coordination you, you see, like the slope isn't yes it's just very small no the slope isn't zero and okay. and i have checked uh, from from both uh, two six alloy and three five alloys as as well and the slope is always very very close to zero but it's not exactly zero now now when the bond is very stiff of course then the slope is uh even much much closer to zero and and when you have a, a more more flexible bond. So, so like, let's say you have a much more covalence in the bond, then it tries to bend a little bit, but it's still very, very far off from the average line. Sure, okay, great, thanks. Okay, thank you. And so, then just to, to paraphrase a, a last question, um, uh, is it correct that you're assuming a site disorder? Uh, yes, and site this is- Site disorder, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 this is the starting slide of my next part. So so right, there is there good. is. I'll let you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. I'll let you continue. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Yuri. So I'll continue on the next one. So I'll 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 quickly um, uh, recap on the last part from from where I uh, ended. Uh, the the first part is that. So we're trying to find the sweet length scale between the local. Uh, uh, structure and the global structure, where we kind of can try to map the information that we get at the local length scale to the global length scale. That's that's the target of, of the next part. So, so with this, we'll uh, start looking at the second near neighbor, which is now, now I have drawn the hexagonal system and, and you can see that there are six short zinc-zinc distances and six long zinc-zinc distances. And these are marked with this particular uh, gray colored atoms. So the dark gray ones are the shorter distance and the one in this plane, there are six zinc ar around the zinc. So those are uh, my um, longer 
um, zinc zinc distances. So, so of course now this is a dope sub lattice. So this has a mixture of zinc and cadmium. Uh, back to the question uh, that that Jerry pointed out the last one, and this is the answer to the question. So so locally when we look at the metal to metal coordination, the number of cadmium around the zinc, we see that both zinc around zinc and cadmium around cadmium, they go very close to the linear composition that you would expect from the, the global uh, stoichiometry that we estimated uh, separately and, and they match up pretty well. So there is no uh, local heterogeneity in the systems that we are looking at. So, so there is no clustering effects or so. So, so the cationic substitution as now that we are confirmed, we can move over to what we are looking at at, at the number of uh, um, zinc and cadmium atoms and where they are situated. And here comes the, the surprise. When you look at the second near neighbor distances, we immediately see that, okay, there are three different kinds of distances, which I think is not very surprising in the sense that we have now a mixture of two atoms. And if you uh, do an um, C, um, I, I think it's um, three C2, and you will get three different kinds of combinations. And this is exactly what it is. We see that the cadmium cadmium distance is still longer. Uh, zinc zinc distances are shorter than the average uh, um, uh, line, which is this is this is the virtual crystal line. And zinc to cadmium distances lie somewhere in between. And the open symbols are from uh, theoretical calculations done done uh, by all Ericsson's group in Uppsala University back when I was doing PhD. So there is clearly a trimodal bond distribution because you have two atoms and the and the, um, at the cationic sub lattice. But the biggest surprise was that when you put in a, a line, which, which is which I have put in for the, for the guide to the eye, this is immediately much closer to the virtual line. As, as you can see that these lines, so, so in, the, in the nearest neighbors, they were somewhere around there. But now the slopes has come much closer to the vir virtual line. So the take home message from this slide is that the second near neighbor distances from zinc or cadmium both approach much closer to the virtual line, which is basically what is deduced from diffraction. Uh, so now we go to the angles. So, so we now know that there is a trimodal distribution of bond distances. What happens to the metal sulfur metal bond angles? Here also we see that there is a distribution of bond angles. So the ideal tetrahedral angle is not conserved anymore. Uh, now we do the other end, uh, like of course we, we could not uh, do the sulfur edge at that point of time. Um, so we looked at the sulfur edge from the theory. Uh, what we saw that the sulfur zinc, sulfur, so the metal mediated angles, they do not change at all. So when we compare the two different uh, angles in the system, we see that the metal sulfur metal angles, they follow a distribution and the local SM4, uh, so, so sulfur to metal uh, unit, that tetrahedral symmetry is broken. Whereas the metal to uh, sulfur four tetrahedral symmetry is preserved. So this immediately tells that to understand uh, zinc cadmium sulfide hexagonal system, a metal sulfur four unit has to be the true structure descriptor of the system. Because if you go to sulfur M4, we can immediately see that this tetrahedral symmetry is broken. And this is because at the M site, we have a mixture of two atoms. So to understand the structure, we have to look at the metal sulfur four unit. So what is happening with the angles? So I try to make a uh, uh, small, small cartoon to explain the distances, how, how the sublattice is, uh, how the cationic sublattice is experiencing um, this, these kinds of effects. So you have tried to put in a cadmium uh, at a zinc site. Cadmium is larger iron, so it will immediately swell the tetrahedra. And we have seen that the cadmium sulfur distances are extremely uh, 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 rigid, very similar to zinc sulfide, but this distance is now longer. So these are sulfur atoms. We are taking a 2D snapshot, uh, sorry, 2D impression of, of, of the three-dimensional cell. 
So, so these open circles are um, sulfur. And when you put in a cadmium, there is immediately an enlargement of the local tetrahedral volume. So what will happen? It will push the sulfurs in these particular directions and will immediately have a buckled system where you will see that the zinc sulfur, zinc distance is these distances. Since the sulfur is being pushed in that direction, this zinc sulfur distance would increase. But the cadmium sulfur zinc distance will decrease. When you do the reverse, you'd see that exactly the opposite thing happens. There is a local shrinking of the tetrahedra and then this sulfur is now being pulled towards the zinc. This will reduce the cadmium sulfur, cadmium angle, which is exactly what you see in the experiment. But now this zinc sulfur cadmium angle, this will try to increase. So there would be a competitive strain on the cadmium sulfur zinc angle, which explains why this particular angle lies in between zinc sulfur zinc and cadmium sulfur cadmium. So what we see is, that the angles, they uh, buckle very selectively to accommodate the strain that you have put in the system by doping at one particular site. So what happens to the next near site? So, so most of uh, the, the volume of literature which is uh, present available today, for example, uh, discusses the metal metal distances or wherever the anion has been replaced. So we went farther to look at the next shell, which um, is, is what uh, makes this work very interesting. Now, in the third near neighbor, we have a spatial distribution of oxygen distance. We have a very short zinc oxygen distance, which is vertically downward in the C-axis. And then you have six different um, zinc atoms, which are slightly larger and some intermediate distances, but these three zinc oxygen distances are closer to the six. And, and it was uh, from the excess analysis, it, this, this was hard to distinguish between the two distances. So I approximated the six plus three combination of long zinc oxygen distances as uh, a total of nine distance. So, so now in the third near neighbor, I'm modeling 10 oxygen atoms. So how does that look? When we check this, that these are the one short distances, uh, zinc sulfur and cadmium sulfur, and these two are the long distances, the nine long ones, we immediately see that the virtual now, a line is now getting almost reproduced. Even for the short distances, there is a spread of distances because uh, this, these uh, uh, ones are farther out in the uh, R, in the art space, but, but we see that the virtual line is now getting extremely well reproduced by the individual interatomic distances that we are seeing at this length scale. Now, when we compare the percentage deviations as we calculated from this, this particular uh, e equation that, that we calculate the slope of the experimental uh, 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 values of the dis is this, these distances normalized by the virtual crystal line. We see from the first shell, which Matt uh, was asking was that, okay, this is very, very high. This deviation was extremely high. The moment we go to the second shell, there's a sharp reduction in the value of the deviation. And you can see that the description has come much closer to the zero um, line. And in the third near neighbor, we see that for the cadmium, this, this ag actually merges with the zero line but for the zinc, it still did not. So, which, which means that probably farther ahead, if, if we still had data until that time, unfortunately we don't, you will see that the local description will completely merge with uh, the diffraction that you get, uh, the diffraction information that you get. So when we go from uh, the distance from 2.4 angstroms to roughly around five angstroms, from the absorbing atom, you will see that there is a gradual evolution of the local structure into the global structure. And this we have shown periodically that, okay, you go from the nearest neighbors to the next nearest neighbor to the third nearest neighbor, there is rotation of the bond angles that, uh, so, so, so basically what the system is doing is that you are putting in a different ion at one particular site and the system changes its angle to accommodate 
the change in volume. And eventually at one length scale, it matches with the global description. So we have rigid uh, first near neighbor distances, and then we have rotations of uh, the MS4 units. And then this distance, uh, uh, cadmium sulfur one to zinc sulfur one, the difference between these two distances, they get reduced as, as, as we have seen from the experiments. And then when you go farther down the crystal, so, so I'm, I'm approximating a lattice as, as spherical shells, you slowly progress and you see that from uh, the percentage deviation from the first to second to the third near neighbor, it gradually goes to zero. And that is why it validates the virtual crystal approximation and hence the Vegard slope. So the lattice uh, most definitely uh, relaxes through an interplay of both bond distances and bond angles. And a simple approximation of lattice parameters to individual bond distances would be misleading. So this is basically what is happening uh, is, is that you have individual very separate distances. And when you probe elements uh, with element specific techniques at the local scale, you'd see a multimodal bond distribution. But when you look at the diffraction, your lattice has both kinds of atoms and you will have uh, two, two different kinds of diffraction. And when you have both of them in the system, you will get an average description, which is a single average. So, so basically, when you look at all the different kinds of models, uh, you will see that they always consider that this, this periodic potential is correct in an average sense. When you translate it down to bond distances, it will immediately collapse. With this, I move on to the third concept that, that, that I'd like to discuss is the chemical pressure. This also came into being uh, for, for more than uh, 60, 70 years. Uh, and, and this is basically um, a so very, on. yes. So on. We, we do yeah. have a few questions. Do you have another break coming soon or is this a good time? Uh, the break is coming soon. Uh, yeah. But, okay. But, we'll wait but for we it. Then. Take it. That's now. fine. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Is it now? Okay. Great. Um, uh, Xiaofang, you had some questions or you had a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, th thank you. And and uh, my question is that uh, if you're due to the, uh, uh, it seems to be looking at the uh, second neighbors or the third na neighbor, you have a polyhedral distortion and which lower, potentially lower your whole symmetry of the unit cell. If that is the case, will you need to revise your unit cell and to check whether it followed the uh, Vegas law? Because your, your Vegas law, which is established in the first few slides was based on the untrained symmetries, right? Yes. So this is a very good question. And, and we have to see what the, what the different concepts are. Vegard's law is applicable only at the sense that, okay, there is no change of symmetry happening. It has to be homogeneous material. Of course, this is given. Uh, and this talks only about lattice parameters. So, so Vegard's law stops only at lattice parameters. So the approximation that we developed based on that, which is virtual crystal approximation, coherent potential approximation. So these models, uh, they took that description and then boiled it down to individual bond distances. And that is where it essentially breaks down. Now, this doesn't mean that the periodic definition is wrong. It's absolutely correct because when you are doing diffraction or what, what these, these, these models are predicting is that, okay, you are doing a volume averaging technique, which is at the length scale of 50, 60 angstroms, but we are operating, uh, if, 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 I, if I show you the, the length scales, you can see we are just at around five angstrom length scales, right? And, and this is where um, XFs comes into handy. It looks at the local distortions, which is non-periodic in nature. It's, it's a uh, process which, which doesn't require symmetry to be preserved, right? So diffraction would of course contain this information, but they will be containing the diffused background and not show up as a particular signal in the system. So an average description of the crystal would always be valid. And that is the reason why you get so sharp black peaks. So the sample is, so, so your system is perfectly crystalline. But when you look closer, you will see that local the symmetry is broken and there's a fancy interplay of change of distances and angle which match up 
and still hold the periodicity of the material. Okay, thank you. Uh, it just additional suggestion in that if you yeah. wanted to verify that, maybe the, the diffusive diff scattering maybe is needed to verify that your overall yes. symmetry did not change. Where, whether whether you need a, a, a new you need a new symmetry model to to do this. Yes, uh, thank I you. Think, yes, and and I think a lot of work uh, on on this particular uh, aspect is being done now. Yeah. 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 Very good. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, do you have a question? Yeah, um, so I think it was two slides previously, you were describing uh, like metal sulfur metal bond angles. Yeah, here, if you uh, if you did this, keeping the cation the same and doing this as an anionic uh, solid solution, would you use the opposite model to describe the changes so it wouldn't be? Exactly, okay. because uh, what turns out is that this is Possibly because you are, it it's, it's related to the sub lattice that you are targeting, you are doping into, and not related to the choice of the metal or the uh, ligand. It depends on the sub lattice. So 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 the definition will just be reverse. There, the metal sulfur uh, for symmetry will be broken, and the ligand to metal description will be preserved. Thank you. Welcome. Matt, you had a question about angles? Yeah, I think this is a related question. I didn't quite understand how the angles were calculated or determined. Is that from the XFs data or is that from yes, some other? Yes, this is, no, this is from the XFs data. We just, so, 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 so these are just from law of triangles, basic uh, trigonometric calculations from, that you get from the nearest distance and the second near neighbor in interatomic distances. So, so does, that, what, does that assume that the that the ang, that the atoms all stay in the same plane? Or? So, so when you are uh, when we are estimating the distance between two atoms, let's say zinc to zinc, we are considering two different zinc, and the angle value that you see is an average of the two different zinc zinc distances that you get. I guess I don't understand how. Uh, how two distances give you an angle in, in three dimensions, <laughs> but okay. No, um, but uh, you you have a zinc to sulfur, and then you have the same distance as sulfur to zinc, right? Sure. And then you have a zinc zinc distance. Sure. And then you can calculate the zinc to sulfur to zinc angle be between them, right? You have three different distances. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yep. Thank you. All right, great. You should continue, please. Okay, so um, then I go to the concept of the ke uh, chemical pressure, which was uh, um, treated, uh, which, which we started with uh, as an equivalence of uh, hydrostatic pressure. So, so what does the concept of chemical pressure say is that uh, when you um, try to press a crystal, and then you uh, reduce the, uh, the volume of the material by, by applying hydrostatic pressure from all sides. But you can do the same thing by replacing a bigger ion by a smaller ion. And this substitution will reduce the cell volume of the system. But think about the other way is that when you do a negative pressure, which is not, not physically po possible when we, uh, when we talk about hydrostatic pressure, but you can do the exact same thing by replacing a smaller ion by a bigger ion that you increase the unit cell volume. And this immediately became uh, e extremely popular because you can now explore the realm of negative pressure. And not only that, uh, the tunability of course on both sides is, is enormous because you are now creating an internal pressure effect within the system by changing the size of the ion and it's an it has been used ever since as a potential tool to change material properties because you can do allophallic doping as well, for example, and then immediately alter the electronic landscape. So we we wanted to check this this, this concept again in terms of uh, the local um, structures, and where it fails is that when we do the pressure structure equivalence by following the bulk modulus, for example, 
we see that for the 10% and 25% samples, this is cadmium doping. We see that when we plug this into the equation, there is an enormous amount of discrepancy that the chemical pressure would predict. So, so this sample clearly doesn't follow the chemical pressure predictions as uh, what, what we observe from the XF distances. Now, we wanted to tackle this problem and, and to do that, we, we, we thought of a system that, okay, we have to formulate um, a, the problem in such a way that we can see the effect of the distance and the angle separately. And this takes us to uh, so, um, double perovskite materials where at the A side there is strontium and by doping at the strontium with a smaller, uh, with the bigger ion barium, we explored the negative chemical pressure and we experience positive pressure by doping in, cal in calcium. And the trick is that, okay, this is, um, uh, SR2FEMO6 has a tetragonal unit cell and it's, uh, it's A to B plane. Uh, the FEOMO angles are very close to 180. So this is the limiting case of an angle and an angle cannot increase any further. So now, now what you do is that if you try to increase, you don't expect any change in the angles. So this will decouple the effect of the change of distance from the angle. With this aim, we went and made a, a series of samples starting from the strontium to barium and uh, calcium. So, so this explores the uh, positive pressure effect and this explores the, uh, neg the negative chemical pressure effect. And you'll see that here, the bond angles, these are all calculated from diffraction. They can change significantly. The angles are close to 150, 253, but on the barium here in this region, the change of angles is almost very, very little. So you can go from uh, the, a lower symmetry tetragonal phase to much lower uh, symmetry monoclinic phase. And by doping in higher, you go to a higher symmetry tetragonal phase. So all by the change of iron, oxygen, molybdenum and bond angles. So now we go to a master plot to see uh, how the distances change. And we'll put everything together. So the way this, this is plotted is that we take strontium iron molybdenum oxide as a central compound and we put in a larger iron. So this explores again the negative chemical pressure effect, which is mentioned at the top. And you put in calcium and you systematically change the doping limit. So how does the molybdenum oxygen and iron oxygen units behave? So this is what the results are. And we can see immediately that for the barium side, there's a stronger relaxation of the distances. Whereas for the negative, uh, sorry, whereas for the positive pressure side, the FEO and MO bond, bond, uh, bond distances hardly change. Now we look at the A site and there is a cube octahedra uh, that you have in SRO2. So right now we, I'm, I'm showing only the strontium oxygen distances and there are three different distances which defines the cube octahedra in the systems. When we look at this, this is what we get. Now we have the opposite trend. We have a stronger relaxation of the strontium oxygen cube octahedra on the positive pressure side and a lower relaxation on the negative pressure side. So, so the A side and the B side responds in very different ways when we explore the positive pressure regime and the negative pressure regime. So, we can see from comparing these uh, two, two slides that the chemical pressure predictions roughly hold for the barium series, but it fails for the calcium series. So why, uh, now, now we want to identify when exactly does the chemical pressure concept work. We go back to the master plot and we now focus only on the negative pressure side. We remember here that the bond angles are not changing too much. They are very close to 180 degrees. So when you try to put in a bigger ion, the angles are already at the maximum values. So only the distance can change. And lattice relaxation is then affect, affected preferentially through bond distances. And hence it scales roughly in according uh, to the uh, chemical pressure predictions. But the moment you look at the um, positive pressure end, 
where you are putting in the calcium, what happens is that the distances, they're already at uh, their minimal value. Now, when you try to put in uh, a smaller uh, atom to compress a unit cell, what it does, it buckles the bond angle because the distances cannot go any shorter. Now, the lattice relaxation is affected preferentially through bond angles and not through distances. So when we stitch these two together, we see that, okay, we can now understand what is going on with the strontium O12 units. When you have the master plot, you'll see that there is much stronger relaxation on the uh, SRO12 cuboctahedra, and this is because of the rotation of the individual octahedral units, because these are the atoms which are now moved moving apart from each other. And now it creates a lot of distortion, but here it, in, it increases in a very linear fashion. And then it hence um, scales perfectly with the chemical pressure line. So what happens is that this defines, this buckling of the angles again, defines strong relaxation of the SRO2 cube octahedra, which does not happen when you dope strontium with barium, the negative chemical pressure regime. So to sum up on this one, when we start from a pure barium iron molybdenum oxygen system, the distances are already 180 degrees. And when you put in strontium, the angles are already constant. So the relaxation of the unit cell is reflected in changing of the bond lengths. But at this particular um, site, we have already reached um, the distances iron to molybdenum, uh, sorry, iron to oxygen and molybdenum to oxygen have reached their lowest attainable values. And then to accommodate the further shrinkage of the unit cell, they buckle with respect to each other. And so essentially chemical pressure as a substitute of physical pressure can only happen if we can create a system where the bond angles do not change when we are trying to perform site substitution. And this is exactly what we wanted to test. Uh, and this was done in collaboration with Madhuri Sumiazulu and Andrew Dichiko um, at two different ex experiments were performed. And you can see when you um, do high pressure experiments on barium, uh, iron molybdenum oxide, and you do chemical pressure by substituting uh, strontium, uh, the high pressure um, data set shows that it scales very well with the uh, chemical pressure line. Whereas when you look at the data on the strontium doping um, with calcium, which is the uh, positive chemical pressure effect, we see that the pressure line does not follow, uh, the, uh, the physical pressure line does not follow the chemical pressure line at all. Uh, this is also reflected um, in the molybdenum oxygen data. Um, so, so we see that there is a stronger scaling of the molybdenum oxygen distances under pressure, but when it comes to um, the doped system, we see that uh, well, uh, when we dope in calcium, uh, the system really doesn't scale um, with, uh, with high pressure as you would expect uh, from the difference between physical and chemical pressure. So we see that in both cases, the equivalence between hydrostatic pressure and chemical pressure holds better for barium strontium system where the bond angles are close to 180 degree, which preserves our uh, previous hypothesis that bond angle should remain invariant when you are trying to do a chemical size substitution. Uh, this was a break, I think, <laughs> previously, but uh, I think I'll now go on. Uh, you should uh, continue. You've got uh, five to 10 minutes maybe? Uh, yeah, how much yeah. more do you have to cover? Uh, I need around seven minutes, maybe. Yeah. Go for it. That's great. Okay. 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 So, so now, based on um, all of these discussions that I did, so so I tested uh, some uh, fundamental concepts which are routinely used even today. Uh, so now this this allows me to create um, a roadmap which is understanding materials and structure at different lane scales. Uh, which I previously did uh, during my PhD. And then now here at the Uppsala, I'm, I'm doing the, the electronic part of this. So now by combining electronic and the geometric structure, you can essentially do much stronger structure property correlation. And this, is a, this essentially 
provides a roadmap for new materials and functionalities. And this is what I do in most of my projects. Um, so I'll just conclude with one example, actually, where um, these, these concepts and some of them has been used. Uh, and, and you will see how uh, beautifully these this, this concepts are inbuilt within a real system that we work with and uh, why it is important to identify them to understand and correctly predict material properties. So, um, uh, ferroelectric photovoltaics are, uh, are, are extremely Im important and a more and more work has been uh, done in recent times. So I'll, I'll not uh, go into the details, but, but the uh, catch is that, okay, there are domains in the material and, and because of these domain walls, you can have very high um, open circuit voltage. And this is why ferroelectrics are used, uh, are, are much more being explored uh, for, the for, for, for the photovoltaic uh, performances. So we, we have taken a barium titanate material. This, this work was done uh, uh, previously with IASC, with, um, with Didi Sharma's group. And I was not involved in the initial part of the project, but we'll come to that in a moment. So, so barium titanate uh, is, is, is a very uh, well-celebrated um, ferroelectric and the titanium off-centering within the TI-06 cage creates the polar mode, which makes the material ferroelectric in the first place. Um, so, but the problem was that these are all very high band gap materials. So, so typically the titanates. So, so uh, as, as you can see that from, from, from the title, this was one of the titles um, that, that we used uh, previously. And now with, with this paper coming through, this is the title of the paper. We wanted to uh, reduce the band gap of the material. To, to utilize the um... did you did uh, Soham Soham freeze or is this a problem with my internet? It's Soham because I hear I see and hear you just fine. Yep, I agree. Okay. All right. We'll give them a minute to, to get back then. <clears throat> okay. Looks like uh, there we are. Hey, you're back. Yeah, you're muted. You're still muted, Soham? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I don't know uh, what you should, uh, yeah, you, you froze there. Uh, you should go ahead and share your screen again, and I'll tell you where you uh, where you left off. And then I'll be able to edit the video to, to splice this out. So is this a... So I think uh, you were at the very beginning of this slide when uh, when you dropped out. You had just uh, a little bit after you would put up. Uh, yeah, keep going, keep going. Good. Just start there. That uh, no, you you got through this one. Okay. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, so so the title of this this part is uh, role of local co doping effects of manganese and niobium in low band gap barium titanate ferroelectrics. And uh, the aim for low band gap was because these titans typically come with a bit larger band gaps and cannot utilize the solar spectrum very effectively. So the trick was to put in D electrons in the system so you can reduce the band gap. But it comes with a detrimental effect that you exchange D0 electrons with DN electrons and it, it immediately leads to polarization loss because the off-centering of the titanium goes down, it breaks down in the long range order. So the idea was to do a co-doping, which, which was conceived uh, in IIS Bangalore in, in Professor D.D. Sharma's group. And I was not involved in that part of the project. I came into it a bit later on this one. Um, and the idea was to co-dope the system with both D0 systems and DN systems so that there is a balance between the two um, uh, ions. So, uh, there was polycrystals has been made on both iron and manganese, and it turns out that the manganese perform better than iron 
Um, and we, we would come to that in a second why that is. And for um, a doping of 7.5% of co-doping of manganese and niobium, so the band gap was substantially reduced and the polarization was written onto uh, like 70% of pure barium titanate. Uh, we went uh, and uh, went ahead and made um, 10 films at uh, Chalmers in Gothenburg. Uh, and the films were, uh, they, they were a bit off symmetric, but there could, um, but, but the film, uh, films re, uh, uh, showed some fairly like response and we are now in the process of trying to improve the film. But the, uh, the, but the materials could be uh, made into uh, good films. We went ahead and probed the gap. Uh, and this was uh, one of the works which got uh, published earlier is that we, when we look at the resonant photo emission, we see that the selectively the manganese states get enhanced. And the calculations also showed that there are manganese states which are growing when you dope into the system in the band gap of barium titanate. And we can clearly now assign that, okay, the new states that has come up due to doping is related to the manganese states. But we got interested in looking at the niobium and uh, what, what niobium is essentially doing in the system and what co-doping together, uh, both manganese and niobium does to the system. And with this, we went ahead and performed titanium KXS and we see the nice uh, pH feature, which um, leads to the quadrupolar transition and a bit of dipolar transition as, as well. But this relates to the uh, titanium off-centering, and we do see that there is a systematic decrease with doping, which means that the, the, the total ferro electricity of the system is going down with some glitch at the 7.5 sample. And the diffraction sh shows exactly the same thing, that the system stays tetragonal until uh, 7.5 percent doping beyond which it becomes cubic. So what essentially happens is that when you dope, you create local uh, modes which disrupt the polar ordering of titanium uh, in the system in BTO. And if eventually beyond 7.5, the moment you try to dope, the system loses all its ferroelectricity. So we went ahead and then probed uh, manganese and niobium individually. And these are the Excel data for manganese and niobium. You can clearly see that the, that the manganese has a bit higher disorder compared to niobium. I'll not go to the details of the analysis, but I'll just give you the results. We immediately saw that there is a classic difference between manganese and niobium. Manganese 3 plus, it's a Yantiller uh, active system. And we saw there's a clear 4 plus 2 distribution of manganese oxygen distances. And, and this, this immediately tells us why manganese leads to the change of band gap and, and basically defines the band gap because of this strong Yantiller distortion. And when we look at the niobium, we looked at all different kinds of models and we found there's a strange one plus five combination of distances. So, so it has one long distance and five short distances. We tried modeling in, in different ways and we saw that only uh, a model where niobium off-centers along the 0, 0, 1 direction is consistent with the X of theta that we see. So we, we, we have manganese and niobium both being doped at a uh, titanium site. One is uh, one shows a strong Yantula distortion and does not uh, participate um, to a large extent in uh, retention of ferroelectricity. But niobium, on the other hand, shows off-centering in the direction of titanium off-centering and possibly contributes to the uh, uh, ferroelectricity of the material. So when we dope it together, uh, we now create uh, a central figure with all kinds of doping. We see that the until distorted manganese reduces band gap and hence reduces the polarization. Whereas on the other hand, off-center distorted niobium restores some of the lost polarization because of manganese doping. And we also see that the absolute difference between the two distances, they all they also uh, follow kind of similar trends, which means that these two together effectively couples to the lattice. And Yantiller inactive uh, iron three plus, which is a D five system, lacks such coupling, and hence why when manganese was replaced by uh, iron, the systems showed 
much higher loss of polarization. And with this, I'd like to conclude. Uh, the first thing is that the solids can assume different structural descriptions at local and global length scales. So it's very important to understand the complementarity between the two different descriptions to achieve a unit structure solution. And all the fundamental concepts that we uh, use, I, I, I have discussed three uh, uh, in a bit detail, the Vegard's law of virtual crystal approximation and chemical pressure. They, they always uh, create a sense of information, which is very average. Uh, and then when you look at the, the individual distances, all these descriptions immediately fail. Uh, chemical pressure, uh, only the positive part, of course, because that, that is only equivalence that you can uh, draw to hydrostatic pressure. But this can be substituted only on the specific geometric criteria, where, which means that the site substitution would involve an angle invariance process. The moment angles change, uh, typically the system would probably go into uh, uh, experiencing change of angles rather than distances. And finally, with one example of barium uh, titanate with co-doped with manganese and niobium, I have shown that the complementarity of structural descriptions are extremely important to see such local distortions and how they influence material properties. Uh, with this, I'd like to conclude. And of course, um, without the help of the collaborators from Bangalore, Chicago, Uppsala, uh, and all the synchrotrons, this could not have been possible and the funding agencies, I'll, I'll not go into the, all the names, but a special thanks to uh, Didi Sharma from, from Bangalore, Carlo from Chicago, and Hawken from Uppsala, who I'm currently working with for making this happen. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everyone, for listening.